The gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, if you would, be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're going to be this morning. How many of you have been to a reenactment of any kind? Any kind of reenactment. Somebody's reenacted something. You know, I love those. And my, I've got an uncle. I was going to put a picture up here, but I didn't want to scare you. And I mean, literally, if you've ever met him or have ever seen him, you can ask my wife. He is a scary-looking individual if you're not ready for him to walk up on you. He is a frontier western reenactor. And what he does is he reenacts the old gunfights, the old K Corral and, and uh, Dodge City and a lot of those things. You may have seen him at Canton. And if you've seen some of those guys, uh, you know, that, that's, you know, You've seen what I'm talking about. He's got the, the pearl-handled pistols, and he's got all of the, the costume, and uh, he's actually played in more than one account. Uh, he's reenacted ju being Judge Roy Beam, and, you know, that's, that was uh, the, the hanging judge, you know, and it's, it's kind of like somebody said the other day when I was trying to say what he was, I actually said he was the Judge Roy Scream. Sorry. No disrespect to my uncle, but he is a cowboy reenactor, and that's what he does. He likes to reenact the old West, and he, he does all those things. He's got the scripts down. He's, he's uh, been uh, you know, all over the South doing this, and, and he, he's a constant reminder to me that I never want to do that. Uh, he makes ugly pretty. Big white beard, nothing wrong with a white beard, Greasy looking old long hair, a top hat, a ruffled shirt with a silver colored button down vest, jeans and a pair of boots with spurs. He's got one belt on to hold up his pants. He, he's got the other belt slung low to hold his 45. He's tied it to his leg. Saw him on TV one time over in Longview, Texas, whenever they were doing a reenactment of the old K Corral during the rodeo there, and he was able to be picked out quite clearly. You could tell who he was. Some of the others, I mean, you know, they, I'm sure their families feel the same way. There is very little sense of pride that I have when I see my uncle in public. Because, see, it may be just a reenactment when we're watching it, but he dresses that way 365 days a year. Seriously. Lisa, is that correct? See, she's shaking her head this way. I have not seen him out of that dress in over 10 years. He's got that same type of outfit on all the time. I love the guy. He's just nuts. My kids think that left unchecked, I might go the same route. No, 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 no. That's the beauty of having a wife that cares about you. Not that Aunt Diane doesn't care about my Uncle Bobby. But I, I love it. I mean, you know, it's a great conversation starter. But it's a, you know, I keep wanting to tell him, Bob, it's a reenactment. It's not your life. I know what he would say. Prove it. Because that's the way he is. He walks around his community that way. I was talking to a lady the other day that lived in the same community of Ben Wheeler with him. She lived there for four months. I said, you may have run into my uncle. And I described her. She goes, oh, yeah. On more than one occasion. She said, you're related to him? And I said, yes. She goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Now, and I don't mean to pick on my Uncle Robert. He loves what he does, but it's, you know, I, I mean, somebody says it's only a reenactment unless you're like my Uncle Robert. 
Robert Lee Farmer believes that it's not just a reenactment. It is his life. It's what he does. He says, I am who I am. And he said, I want you to know that that's who I am. And I want people to know that that's who I am. Not too many years ago, Lisa and I were talking about, uh, about our, you know, th this life is so short. And we want to, when we die, what do we want written about us? And what do we want said about us? I said, uh, and I've always said this, I want this on my tombstone. It, I doubt it will ever get there, but this is one of the things that would be nice. Preacher by trade, farmer by name, preacher by trade, cowboy at heart. I love the cowboy way. I really do. I love to read about it. I love to, to think about it. I love watching old westerns, even though, you know, it's not always true. You know, if you go back and you look at the idea of how many gunfights there were uh, back in the old west, there's not as many as there are movies made about the ones that were in the old west. It's just not there. It just didn't happen that way. It was kind of crazy. I mean, there were there were several, but it wasn't like it, you, you know, people say it used to be where... You know, people do that. That's just reenactments. But I haven't reenacted anything. I don't want to reenact anything in that sense. But I also want to remember that God in includes me in his life. And we're going to get back to that in just a moment. Because in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9, it talks to me as an individual and, and God talks to me as an individual through the Apostle Paul. And he talks to you as an individual this morning. And it says, and to give you who are troubled rest. And I know all of us at one point in our lives or another have realized how troubled we really are. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and in flaming fire. Notice, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Je Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Let's pray. Father, you are awesome. And no, we don't have all the answers. We, we, we struggle sometimes to have all the questions. But today, Father, I pray that we will become reenactors. That we will believe in the reenaction that so many people go through on a regular basis. That we will come to become, that we will become, Father, and come to a knowledge of the people you would have us to be. Show us, Father through your word, what we need to do. Show us, Father, and tell us what we need to do through your word. For it's in your holy son's name we pray. And the church said, amen. Notice what he says here. There's going to come a day whenever there's going to be vengeance taken on those who do not obey the gospel. I don't know about you, but it, it, to me that's important. But did you notice that right before that it says he's also going to take vengeance out on those who do not know him? And how do you get to know someone if unless you are able to have a relationship with them in some way or another? And here Paul writes this church and says, look, this is very important for you to understand there's going to be vengeance taken on those who do not know God. There's going to be vengeance taken on those who do not obey the gospel. These shall be punished. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not something that I enjoy looking at. I don't even like the reenactment of punishment, you know. Punishment's bad enough, but you want to reenact it? No, I don't think so. You know, it's like my parents used to say, you got one whipping you on another one? No, not really. I mean, since you're asking, that's not something I want to do. I don't want to be punished. Punishment is not something to be accepted happily. Although God says that suffering is to be accepted joyfully. We have to remember that. 
Just a moment ago, Eric read to us 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. So this idea of reenactment is what I want you to bring to your mind, and I want your mind to be open to that idea of reenactment. But also I want you to remember and listen and think about what it says in 2 Thessalonians that we just read because it's so impactful. Keep those thoughts in your head as we read this together. I, moreover, brethren, declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are sa- also you are saved. If you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, I understand that there's a lot of people who do reenactments and that type of thing, but but I want you to keep that thought in mind. What is it about this that I have to do to reenact? Well, there's some information He talks about the fact that Jesus died. And that when Jesus died, he was buried. And that when he was buried, he was also raised. And that's important for us to understand that the gospel is that death, that burial, and that resurrection of Jesus. The apostle Paul said the gospel is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we have to obey the gospel to be saved. That's what he said in 2 Thessalonians. That God will take vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says here in this passage that it's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus that is the gospel. And we need to understand that Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Why do we need to obey the gospel? It's because that we have been separated from God. We do not hold a place with God whenever there is sin in our lives. In the sense that we have not obeyed the gospel. It's not that God's arm's too short. It's not that he can't reach and grab hold of us, nor is it that he can't hear us. When I was growing up, there was a great, I say growing up, growing up in the church, there was a great debate in the area that I was in and some of the people that I was with that God never heard a sinner's prayer. I didn't get that one, did you? I just didn't make sense. Because if I'm not mistaken, you know, it, Paul spent three days in prayer before he became a Christian, and I'm, I'm thinking that God listened to what he had to say. Somebody says, well, that means that God doesn't answer a sinner's prayer. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. I prayed that God would give me insight into his word to find whatever truth there was to be found. I hadn't been a Christian yet. Hadn't become a Christian yet. I believe God answered that prayer. See, we get the misconception that God doesn't answer a sinner's prayer. That's that's not what that's talking about. What it's talking about is that what God does not do is hear this request for the forgiveness of our sins when we pray unless we come into terms with him. And the terms he said in 2 Thessalonians is, is that we've got to obey the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, that to obey the gospel, we have to obey the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what the gospel is. And here, the reason why we need to obey the gospel, Isaiah says, is because that we have iniquity in our lives, and we have sin in our lives, and we have those things. It's not that God's arm's too short or his ear too dull to hear, but it's our iniquities that have separated us from God. It is our sins that has caused him to hide his face from us. So what do we do? See, Jesus took care of the sin problem with his death. When he died, that part of the gospel is true. His sins were, I mean, our sins were placed upon the cross for those who have accepted that and have obeyed that gospel. Our sins were uh, taken care of because of that death. But not only that, I want you to realize, the question is, is so why does the gospel say he was raised for us as well? Because whenever he came down off of that cross and he was buried in the ground for three days and whenever he was resurrected, he started a new life. 
It was different. He was the first one ever resurrected never to die again. And as he was never expected or to, to die again, to be raised from the grave, he's never expected to die again. And he went up into heaven to be with his father. He sat out at the right hand of God and is waiting on God to say, Jesus, go get your bride. Bring her home. And who is that bride? Those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Why was he raised to become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? For since by man came, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, and even, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. How do you want to be Christ? If you're not a child of God, if you've not obeyed the gospel that he says, then there's going to be vengeance poured out upon you. If you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, God says there's going to be vengeance poured out. God's going to hide his face from us. We'll not be able to be in his presence. So what do we do? If God says we must obey the gospel to be saved, how am I supposed to obey that gospel? Let's take a look. Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised. That's something that we need to understand. That's what it says. The gospel reenacted at baptism. How we get into Jesus' death is by being immersed in water. That's what baptism means. That's what the word baptizo means. That was transliterated. If we put it into English today, it would be the word immersion. It would be to be submerged in water. It means to sink, to go under. And that's what he's asking us to do. Jesus died for our sins. We are therefore buried with him in a watery grave to be raised like Jesus, a new creature. Romans 6, 3 through 6. Or do you not know? that all of us who were baptized, Paul including himself in that, into Christ were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have and live a new life. I think that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? The death, the burial, the resurrection. We baptized into his death. Jesus died on the cross. We reenact that. We die to our sins. We say, we tell the world, I want to repent of my sins. I want to give them up. We tell God, God, I don't want to have these sins against me anymore. I want to be right with you. And everyone who does that and is baptized into Christ will be baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death. In order that just as Christ was raised from that stone rock grave, we too will be raised from that watery grave of baptism. Resurrected from the dead. Ready to live a new life. That's what obedience to the gospel is. The death, the burial, the resurrection to obey that, to reenact that, is to die to sin. You know, I told you earlier I didn't want to be a reenactor. I don't as far as for anything on this earth. I really don't. But this is one reenactment that I wanted in my life. I want to be able to see others reenact that death, that burial, that resurrection, just like Trevor did. I want you to know that it's explained so simply that it's an obedient act of faith. There's nothing special about the water. It's just water. It's H2O. Nothing special about the person doing or the, or the, the words that, that, that some people 
are, are so accustomed to hearing. It's about that giving of our lives in faith to God, obeying that gospel that God has given us to obey, to die to this world and its sin, to be buried in that watery grave of baptism, and then to be raised to walk a new life. Now, that is a reenactment I want evident in my life, and I want to walk it every day. Romans 1 16, for all, for, I'm sorry, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Some people don't want to talk about the gospel because they're ashamed of the gospel. They don't want to talk to others about what it means to be a Christian or, or how good it is to be a Christian or how your lives are affected by your Christianity because they're ashamed. But Paul writes, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Are we ashamed of the gospel? Is that why we, we don't want to share the news about that reenactment that we went through for those of us who are children of God? It may be the fact that you have not gone through that because you have not understood what it means to become a child of God. That it is a reenactment of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I don't, I don't know where you are personally, spiritually. But this is one reenactment that you need to live every day. A reenactment that you need to have in your life to be like Jesus so what is the gospel of Christ? The apostle Paul said the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Can't deny that. Paul pretty much said it in place. He explained it. So what do we do? We understand that Jesus died. We understand that he was buried and he was raised on the third day. We have to live that. How do you live that? You live it by telling the story. See, that's what a reenactment is. It's the telling of a story. I'll never forget the first time I went to, over to Vicksburg, to the battlegrounds there at the Civil War uh, site there, and they, they were, there were some men there doing a reenactment. I thought that was, that was really cool, the smell of the gunpowder and the cannons going off and the, and the, and the, you know, the, the, the smoke in the air and the, the feel of that hot July afternoon. To see those hills where those men fought and died and I thought about that on the way home that man I, you know I can't imagine what it must be like it must have been like as we learned of the hunger and the starvation that happened and the deaths that happened it's a reenactment was all it was but for us it needs to become our lives this death this burial in this resurrection. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7 it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the richness of his grace. When Jesus hung on that cross, he spilt his blood. It spilled out on the ground. He was buried Three days later, he was raised. I thank God that God did that, that he raised his son from the grave, for without that resurrection, we have no hope. It wasn't just that the blood was spilt. It's not just that he was buried. See, the key to it was is that he was raised. It was the resurrection that was different. Now listen to me very closely. You may have been told that baptism is not important, that it doesn't really need to take place. That if you believe in your heart that God is who he is and his son is who he is, if you die to your sins, you, you're going to be all right. Well, Jesus died, and so did everybody else. See, it's not just about dying. And believe it or not, it's not just about being buried. All dead men are buried in some way or another, whether it's cremation or their bodies are just lost or they're buried by their family in the ground. 
It's not just about those things, folks. See, that's the, not the key. The key is that my Jesus didn't stay in that grave. He came up out of that grave. And he came out of that grave so that we could reenact that death, that burial, and that resurrection. So that we could have the hope of eternal life. So that God will not take vengeance on us because we do not know him nor because we have not obeyed the gospel. Because when we know him, we will want to obey the gospel. How wonderful is this forgiveness? Well, I don't know about you, but to me it's pretty good. I don't know about you, but it stands pretty high with me. If somebody asked me, would you take a billion dollars and give up your soul? Well, you know, I'd, I'd, no, I wouldn't. Well, what about 10 billion? What about the, what if you could rule the world? See, human part of me says, you know, I know that'd be tempting, but spiritually I'm sitting here going, I'm no idiot. Contrary to popular belief, I'm no idiot. I know that the end is not going to be worth it. When I die, I'm going to be dead like Rover, just dead all over. No, 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 no. When I die in that state, saying that I would give up my belief in God and my stat status with God and walk on this earth as its ruler supreme, you think that's, that's a temptation? It is to any man. Until you stop and you think about what the payment's going to be. Because, see, just like anything else given to you, there's always a catch. With God, the catch is heaven. I just want to be loved. He's a little selfish in a good way. He says, I made you, I want you to love me. Parents are selfish, aren't we? We want our children to love us. That's, that's a good kind of selfish. See, that selfishness is called, I love you. I love you. I want you to be with me. I brought you, you know, Bill Cosby's famous for saying, I brought you into this world, I can take you out. God said, I brought you into this world, I can take you out, but I want to bring you home. And I'm ready to go. Why? Because I have that relationship with God. I have gone through the reenactment of his son's death, his burial, and his resurrection. How wonderful is that forgiveness? It is far beyond this world. See, Jesus took care of our sin problem with his death. And in doing so, gave us the hope for life. And if we choose salvation through Christ's gospel, will our lives change? Yeah. Now, does that mean that I'm going to get all of my physical th needs taken care of? No, 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 no. It's not talking about physical things. It's talking about what? Spiritual things. It doesn't mean that things aren't going to get easier. It's not going to get nicer. If you're going through struggles now, you're going to go through struggles then. It's just that the end result is that you're going to get paid by God in the end with love. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of God. Who's going to inherit it? The children of God. See, all of those things are things that people are doing and saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. Oh, there's nothing that, 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 that this isn't sin. This is just the way we are. We were born this way. That's fine. Just tell God when you get there, I'm sure he'll make you understand what he meant. But what if I don't change? Well, the end's not going to be good. Matthew 7, 21 to 23, from the message. Knowing the correct password. I love the way this reads. Saying, Master, Master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. What is required is serious obedience, doing what my Father wills. I can see it now. At the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and say. Master, we preached the message. We bashed the demons. Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you not know what I'm going to say? You missed the boat. 
All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. Now, I don't know about you, that's pretty simple English, isn't it? And if that's the way we were today, if Jesus talked the way he did back then or whenever we written our translations of the Bible, the message gets it right here. You're out of here. If you don't obey the gospel, you don't know God, you're out of here. God doesn't know you. So how do you do? So to get into the saving gospel and avoid destruction, what does God say I must do? Once again, 1 Thessalonians 79, to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. If God says we must obey the gospel to be saved, then how am I supposed to obey the gospel? In Romans 6, 3 through 6 that we read earlier, or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also have been in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that they should no longer be slaves of sin. Then in 16 and 17, but God be thanked that you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Have you obeyed that gospel? Have you died to sin? Have you been buried? Have you been raised to walk that new life? Galatians 3, 26 and 27, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you, you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you put him on? If you choose to be buried with Christ, it won't always be easy. Satan will do all he can to alter your path. But it becomes a choice that you have to make. Today, it's either yes or no. Because we're not promised tomorrow. In Acts 22 and verse 16, it gives us the answer of what we need to do. I want to take just a moment and please go ahead and stand. Let's be standing, and I want you to take just a moment, especially if you're not a child of God this morning, and I want you to read this passage of Scripture because it means so much. And now what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If you need to do that this morning, we're here to welcome you, to assist you, to share with you even more. But if you need to step out this morning, our shepherds are going to be passing among us. Grab one of them by the arm. Come with them. Grab somebody else walk with you. Don't wait any longer. Amen. Do it now. While